Now yesterday we got an excerpt and cover art from the upcoming Star Wars book Shadow of the Sith, a book that will be released on June 28th of this year and that will be set 10 years before the events of the sequel trilogy and we'll see Lando, who has had a daughter kidnapped right from his arms, as well as Luke, who's been having dark visions, trying to unravel the mystery of the returning Sith as the two search for a Wayfinder device to get to Exegol, all the while Ochi, the Sith assassin briefly seen in The Rise of Skywalker, searches for Rey and her parents, the key to Palpatine's return. And in this brief excerpt, which I'll include a link to in the description below should you want to read it for yourself, we find Luke at the Seeing Stone on Tython, the one we saw Grogu use in Season 2 of The Mandalorian, which ended up, you could say, kind of summoning Luke to him in the finale of that season. Anyway, Luke uses the Seeing Stone and apparently has a vision where he is taken or teleported to Exegol, though he's unsure whether it's real, it feels real to him, or indeed just a vision. And since, for better or worse, teleportation is sort of a thing in Star Wars now, Luke does a version of it, and Kylo and Rey, due to their dyad, can pass things to each other across time and space. And with the Seeing Stone being a sort of focal point in the Force, it could be that he is actually there somehow, that he has teleported to Exegol. He even briefly wonders, or worries, at one point how he's going to get back. Anyway, while there on Exegol, he encounters nine Sith Wraith-like creatures wielding red lightsabers that encircle and attack him. However, they seem to be rather incorporeal or made of ash and Luke is unable to harm or stop them, though when the lightning flashes, they seem to almost take solid form. And he's able to block their lightsabers, though seem to be real. Eventually then Luke falters and they are about to finish him off when a ghostly blue figure wielding a blue lightsaber comes to his rescue. At first Luke thinks it's Ben, meaning the Obi-Wan Ben, not his nephew Ben. When he realizes it's actually his father Anakin, Luke then takes his father's hand, there's a flash of light, and the excerpt ends. And for what it's worth, which is just a small clip from a much larger book, it's a well-written little clip and an enjoyable read. And if I had to make a guess here, as soon as Luke takes his father's hand, again, there's this flash, and I'd imagine he'll just be back on Tython and Anakin's Force Ghost, assuming that's indeed what it is, we'll be gone and we won't get the conversation between father and son that uh, we probably should have got at some point in the sequel trilogy. And speaking of all that, and no, this isn't about to just turn into a let's bash the sequels video, as always, I'll try to be as fair and honest as I can be towards them. But it's almost fitting in a way to get this excerpt now because I've been talking a lot lately in videos about the books and comics of the new canon and how they tend to get relegated to making sense of or filling in the blanks of or expanding on what happens in the films. And given the synopsis we got for the book, which I kind of summarized at the start of the video, and now this little taste of the book itself that apparently features Anakin, who, as kind of mentioned before, was notably absent from the sequel trilogy. His name is never even uttered in a single one of the films, and he's reduced to a few speaking lines at the bitter end of Episode Nine, along with all the other Jedi. But it seems this book is going to try and do quite a bit of patchwork. Because love or hate them, the sequel trilogy certainly left a lot of gaps to be filled, especially when it comes to what exactly happened to Luke Skywalker beforehand, how he went from hopeful Jedi Knight ready to rebuild the Order at the end of Return of the Jedi, to a dejected hermit in The Last Jedi who had given up on the Jedi and pretty much everything else. I mean, it couldn't be just one bad night or peek into his nephew's mind that destroyed him and made him give up on everything. There has to be a much, much bigger story there arguably a whole other trilogy worth of explanation and story for it all to truly make sense and be accepted more by some of the fans. Because, as I've said before, the why I think Luke is a symbol of hope and perseverance, the personification of it, you could even argue, I do not think he is completely infallible. I wouldn't say that there is nothing that could or would ever break Luke Skywalker, or that I can't see him ever making mistakes along the way, and some pretty big ones. Even in the expanded universe, where so many who probably didn't read it seem to think or say that Luke attains something to god-like status, and yes, he does become very powerful there, to be honest, but he was far from infallible even in the EU. He made a lot of mistakes, he is bailed out by others all the time, and even brutally avenges the death of Mara Jade, his wife, by killing the wrong person. 
And as I've suggested before, if perhaps that fateful night in The Last Jedi, if Luke sees that it was, say, Ben who at some point in the past murdered Mara Jade and that's why he freaked out the way he did, then maybe you have something there. Especially if, to honor the EU in a way, it wasn't actually Ben who did it, that he almost snapped on and almost killed the wrong person again, that it was all a trick of Palpatine who was at this point every voice Ben had ever heard inside his head, and was then somehow the one showing Ben killing Mara Jade to Luke, even though it didn't actually happen that way. And it's all done just to cause Luke to react and thus push Ben over the edge and to the dark side. And honestly, I think something like that could have worked if set up from the start, or with any sort of setup or context whatsoever, which is again what's lacking in The Last Jedi. We get one flashback from a couple different points of view, and that's supposed to explain everything we need to know between these two very important characters, those being Ben and Luke. And the thing is, it's certainly not impossible to drastically change heroes or to even sort of flip the roles that they play. One example of this I like to use, though not as, say, extreme as breaking Luke Skywalker, is Captain America and Iron Man in the MCU, and how these two characters basically flip or exchange ideologies in the films thanks to their own unique experiences and experiences we get to see along the way. At the start, to oversimplify their stories for the sake of brevity, Captain America is the good soldier following orders, the one that believes in a greater authority above him. While it's then Iron Man, or Tony Stark, who, at the start of his story, thinks he should be the one making the calls, who believes fully and entirely in his own judgment and doesn't think anyone gets to tell him what to do with his little suit of armor. But come the movie Civil War, after both characters have had other movies to subtly grow and change, it's now Tony arguing that they should defer to a greater authority, and Captain America, who thinks they should be making their own calls. Again, they flipped beliefs entirely, and it's done so well, so subtly and perfectly, that you don't immediately realize the change, or should I say you don't find it odd or jarring. And you can also see things from both perspectives, and are unsure who to even root for or who you agree with. However, if you went from, say, the end of the first Iron Man movie, when Tony makes his bold declaration that he is Iron Man, to him then being very unsure of himself and rather reserved in civil war and believing he should yield to others suddenly, you'd think this is some terrible storytelling. And this is the problem so many have with Luke, and his change is much bigger and more profound than, say, a Tony Stark in the MCU. We're making the jump from very optimistic and a hopeful Luke to completely lost and dejected and missing all the important story beats in between that sets up the change and makes it potentially believable or acceptable. Which, yes, even if done incredibly well, is something that, no, not every fan is necessarily going to like or want to swallow, considering, again, they see Luke as the personification of things like hope and loyalty, not someone who would ever give up on the Jedi or his family and friends, and especially not someone who would almost kill his nephew in his sleep. And certainly some will make the argument that they're giving you the backstory now. They're giving you the context to make The Last Jedi work with books like Shadow of the Sith. But the problem with that, besides it happening in a book not everyone is obviously going to read, is many don't or won't see this as a natural story or a natural progression anymore. Like it would have been had we got a linear fashion story. Had there been some sort of major content released before the sequels that began to show the fall of Luke. Instead, right or wrong, they'll just see this as now trying to justify something many fans didn't like, trying to retroactively quote-unquote fix a mistake made with their favorite character, creating context after the fact to align with a predetermined endpoint that they don't like in the first place. And they'll then go on to say that it's simpler to just toss all that stuff away, erase the endpoint that didn't make sense, and try all over again, to give us a more linear story with Luke this time around, starting with what we've seen of him in The Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett, which feels like a natural step or an organic continuation of his story after Return of the Jedi. Another problem here, a big problem, is some of those things at the end point that you now have to lead up to and explain are, to be brutally honest, they're near impossible to explain in a way that will truly make sense. And trying to make sense of it can have a double-edged sword effect, where every question you answer or everything you try to fix, every plot hole you fill, leads to even more questions, problems, and contradictions. For example, in a recent Darth Vader comic book, one that takes place shortly after the events of Empire Strikes Back, Vader makes his way to Exegol and learns of the Sith fleet being constructed there, which, yes, already creates the problem of, 
why build a second Death Star when you had this fleet? And why was it not put into action sooner? Why was there seemingly some sort of strange long-term plan of Palpatine dying, coming back, and then finally using this fleet? Are they implying Palpatine foresaw his death and then return, but didn't see that he would die again? Anyway, even setting all that aside, Vader seeing this fleet at this point in time means obviously Anakin knows about the fleet once he comes back at the end of Return of the Jedi and about this hidden threat. So we can ask why doesn't he mention that to Luke at the very end of Return of the Jedi? And I know father and son saying hello and goodbye to each other but limited time, there just wasn't a chance. He just wanted to look at his son with his own eyes and die in peace and I can accept that answer. Problem is, Anakin comes back as a Force ghost on Endor a couple hours later, essentially. And, I don't know, that seems like a pretty good time to bring up Exegol and the Sith fleet, right when the Rebellion is on the verge of victory over the Empire, or feels like they are on the verge, not knowing about, again, this long-term master plan of Palpatine's. But even if Luke doesn't talk to them at that point, to the Force ghosts, which sure is possible, I guess they may have other things to do besides chat with Luke right there and then, or perhaps Luke had other things to do, like celebrate with his friends. In this upcoming book, it potentially is going to have Anakin speak with Luke at some point, at least that's what it's alluding to here in this little excerpt. And considering Luke already knows about Exegol at this point, he's looking for a way there in this book, he's visited it in a vision, perhaps? Wouldn't Anakin then talk to him about the full extent of the threat presented by Exegol? And if he did, wouldn't Luke not only pass on that news to someone else, to the New Republic for example, but also think it was a really, really bad time later on to exile himself when Palpatine was indeed back, and with a fleet of Death Star Destroyers at his command? But anyway, these are just a couple examples of what I mean. I can come up with many more. Like, for example, wouldn't Luke assume Ben was being influenced by these returning Sith before just freaking out like he did that night? I mean, isn't that what he was going in there to look for in the first place that fateful night? But anyway, again, these are just a couple examples of what trying to add to or tell the story retroactively, or should I say not thinking about how it's all going to fit together with past parts when you're creating the sequel trilogy in the first place, that it's a problem that is not easy to fix, one that can cause even more problems as you try. And look, I probably will never love the sequel trilogy, but I am curious to see how they try to make sense of all this. I am curious to see what their plan is, and if they can actually pull something off. Again, it may not make me love the sequels, it may not make me love Luke and The Last Jedi, it probably won't. But I still am curious, and I'm still going to cover it, even though I think there are other better options that they could go with to try to quote-unquote fix the franchise, and I will discuss that in my next video, and though they don't involve just retconning the sequels. Well, that's all I've got for you this time. Now it's your turn to take to the comments below and tell me what you think about this new book, tell me what you think about trying to fix Luke, and if they had gone the other way, if they had set it up and taken the time, do you think it could have worked? Whatever the case may be, you know what to do. Leave a comment below and let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.